to. So let's go to our Bibles, our iPhones, however you're reading Scripture. We'll put it on the screen, and you can follow along in the worship guide. Uh, we gave you some message notes if you'd like to follow along. Let's do it. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says, when they saw the courage, it's visible. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Amen. amen. That's my amen corner. Shout out. That's, that's him too. <laughs> it's awesome. And uh, I love this verse because it shows us that courage isn't just an action. It's something that's visible in our lives too that doesn't even require words. I, I love what St. Assisi of Augustine said. He said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. That our lives as men and women and Christians in general should be communicating a message to the world around us. Not just on Sundays when we put on our Sunday best and we give everybody the God bless you, hallelujah, amen, God is good all the time. He's Right? That we would be honest and transparent in every area of our life and that those farthest away from God would see a visible courage in and through our life. My question to you today, is your faith visible? Is your courage visible? When people see you, man of God, do they see something that they don't have that draws them to wanting your God? Do they see something in your life and on your life that makes them want to cultivate a relationship with God that they currently don't have? The word Saul is really translated observe or consider. Now think about that, that when people are watching our life, what are they doing? They're observing to see if your actions, come on somebody, follow your words or are you all talk and no action. They're considering, imagine that, that life's not perfect, Monday's not going to be perfect. But the way you live can be a visible courage to other people to where now they will consider giving their life to your God and surrendering to his perfect will and plan. That, that's a high responsibility, but also a great honor to be able to have. I love the scripture says that the courage was visible not on people of high pedigree and, right, of, of noble uh, title and royalty. These were ordinary and unschooled men. I, I don't know about you, but I went to school, but I was unschooled in school. You know, my GPA really wasn't what it needed to be, and always felt kind of ordinary. And I'm so thankful we serve a God who will put his extra on our ordinary. I'm so thankful we serve a God who will put his super on our natural if we will just yield our lives to him and follow his plan. And that we as men don't have to bring God anything else other than who he's made us to be. Can I tell you that today? God wants you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It says these men were unschooled. They, they, they didn't have doctorate degrees. They, they weren't maybe the sharpest crayons in the box. Come on, somebody. I love the, the thought that it's just as wrong to think that formal education qualifies somebody as it is to think that the lack of education disqualifies somebody. God can choose and raise up any man, any woman at any time to accomplish his, his purpose because it's his kingdom. And so if you haven't had a perfect Christian track record, if you haven't had a perfect life, if you come from a divorced home, if you come from uh, poverty, if you come from anything other than what you wish you would have come from, I believe that makes you the perfect candidate to be used by God in a mighty way. The word ordinary in the Greek is idiotes. These guys were idiots, okay? So that's where we get the English word idiots and that just really brought a lot of confidence to me. I'm like, okay, God can even use idiots. Praise the Lord. And uh, don't sound bite that. Uh, pastor says that we're all idiots. I didn't say that, okay? You said that. I'm just reading the Bible. But I do believe if we're going to have a visible courage, we have to identify and call out some of the arch nemesis, some of the enemies of our courage. And I know for men, there's a lot of them, but I put them into three so that hopefully we can maybe see which one is our greatest nemesis and overcome it 
in Jesus' name today. Can I get a good amen? amen. The first one I wrote down, if we're going to live a life of courage and we're going to be attacked and tempted not to, is self-doubt. Self-doubt. You know, from birth, I, I don't know about our female counterparts, but I can tell you as a man, from birth, as soon as we have the cognitive ability, we're asking ourselves a question. Am I enough? Do I have what it takes? Am I measuring up to the standard? We have this nature that causes us to want to prove ourselves. And what happens is if we make mistakes, if we get caught up in some sin struggles, shame creeps in and self-doubt of God's plan and purpose for our life begins to consume us and overtake us. Some of us are doubtful because of fears of what peer groups will think if we really come out of the crowd and live a life of courage for Christ. Some of us are insecure because we didn't have an earthly father who affirmed us and approved of us and showed us acceptance. But can I tell you, as the father said to the son when he came out of the waters of baptism, you are my son in whom I love and am well pleased. You need to know your God loves you. And he spoke that over Jesus before Jesus performed one miracle. For those of you who feel like you need to perform in order, in order to get God's love, that's not even in the Bible. That before the foundations of the world, he chose you. And he formed you. And the Bible says he has a purpose and plan for your life before you proved yourself at all. That's why the Bible says in Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God made his appeal, and he made his boat of approval before you even committed your life to him. This is the goodness of God. And what the enemy wants to do is come in and bring a different narrative, create a different conversation between our ears that will lead us to be hesitant and inactive. And if we're inactive, we eventually withdraw. Well, if I'm not fighting, why am I even here? I need to shrink back. And as we shrink back from the call of God on our lives, we end up hiding in our shame, in our depression, in our most recent sin struggle. The question we have to ask ourselves is, does God know and does God care? And the answer is a resounding yes. Look at the scripture in James 1 verse 6. God already knows. He just needs you to do what he's created to help you, and that is to reach out. And to pray. And the Bible says, and when you pray, when you ask, you must believe and say it out loud, not, not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You see that word double-minded means there's a divided interest. And if we're playing church, if we're in on Sundays and coasting on Monday, you will be double-minded, not because God doesn't love you, because you haven't chosen whom this day you will serve. But oh, if you will come out of the boat and step onto the water with your eyes on Jesus and say, though none go with me, I shall follow. I will leave this life behind and put my focus and attention on Christ. I'm not going to live double-minded. I'm not going to be two-spirited because God has given me one spirit, and it is the spirit that is willing even though the flesh is weak. We've got to overcome our self-doubt, lay, lay aside the undivided heart, and let the Lord bring us to a resolve that says, I'm not listening to the voice of a stranger. I'm listening to the good shepherd. And though I have doubt, I can bring those doubts to God, and when I do, and I bring them, he will secure my steps and order my path in Jesus' name. Say amen right there. Amen. If we do anything with our doubts, here's my encouragement. Why don't you doubt your doubts? You want to doubt something, why don't you doubt the doubts the enemy's feeding you? Number two, a big nemesis that we face as men is societal pressure. Culture has a narrative. There's some social norms. There's some expectations. And sometimes... We shrink back in fear, and we don't want to rock the boat and create controversy so we don't step into our manhood, and we don't lead our families. And some of us have a home where our wives are more spiritual than us. And I always feel that about my wife. 
So I'm not saying it's, it's not a real thing, but what I'm saying is you have to take your rightful position in Christ and lead by serving. Stop trying to keep up. Stop trying to measure up. Stop, stop living under the stress and pressure of a work and an earthly kingdom that you feel the pressure to build. Are you building something God didn't ask you to build? Because of a culture, n- cultural norm that has said this is what your life should look like as a man if you want to be successful? Can I tell you biblical success is simply one word? Obedience. It's obeying what God has put in your life and doing what he has said to do because he's not made you a carbon copy. Let me show it to you in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that the testing you may discern what the will of God is, the good and acceptable and perfect will. The Bible says we're to be in the world, but not of it. Some of us are in it and sort of like it. The word transform there comes from a word you've heard before, metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's the the picture of the caterpillar transforming into the butterfly. In the natural mind, it's impossible. How does that happen? But the thesis of the word is you've got to leave the immature state that you're in and go on to spiritual maturity. You, 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 You may start as a baby Christian. We all do. But God doesn't want you to stay where you start. He wants you to grow. He wants you to go on the journey. But we've got to leave self-doubt. We've got to leave societal pressure. Otherwise, we'll stall out. We'll become stagnant in our faith. And the gospel, by definition, is change. Are you changing? Are you becoming the person God created you to be? We, in some way, shouldn't recognize ourselves year over year, spiritually. Now, we can't control the attack. We can't control what happens to us. But my heart is my responsibility. I'm in full control of my surrender to Christ and my vulnerability between other men, letting Christ form his perfect, good, and pleasing plan in my life. And you are too. we got to be transformed. Number three, selfishness. The Bible says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility consider others above yourself. Notice the Bible says selfish ambition. In other words, ambition is not unbiblical. It's just when the nature of it is selfish. I I, I was always confused about that. I was like, okay, so to be a Christian, do I have to just be a doormat? Do I have to just be weak and just praise the Lord. God bless you. It's like throwing curveballs. God bless you. No. The Bible says violent, in violence we lay hold of the kingdom and in violence we advance it. That you can bring everything you bring to the workplace and to other spaces. Surrender to God. He wants that grit and that passion and that zeal. Like David said, that zeal for his house to consume you. We're going to be consumed as men. It might as well be by the spirit and the power of God. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Selfishness is associated with childlike mindsets. Because I don't know about you, some of the first words our kids said was mine. Right? Mine. And God wants us to live an open life and leave behind societal pressure, self-doubt, and step into a relationship with him. I really love what the text said where it said Peter and John. When they saw the courage, and then it lists very specifically two disciples of Christ. I don't think the Bible puts things there by accident. I just don't. And so when we look at these two men, we begin to see that God's courage on a man's life can look different. Peter was the aggressor. Peter was the one who taught before he thought. Come on. Anybody like that? You you say saying, come on, husbands, you know you do. You just said it, and you're like, "Let let me get that back. Let me. That was Peter. He acted before he thought. He was 
kind of the guy, uh, ready, aim, or ready, shoot, aim, whatever it is, you know, like just go and not thinking. But John was more reflective. John was more sensitive. And the enemy has created a narrative that if you're not the mindset and the personality of a Peter, then you don't really have courage. If you like the arts, if you're sensitive, then you're something else instead of a man. And the Bible is telling us that whatever personality and whatever form of manhood God created, the goal is that you would become the person he created you to be. That whether we're a John and we're reflective and we're just more passive in our mindset and our approach, or whether we're a Peter and we're out front, that we should be the people that God is looking for in the earth today. I want to give us three quick handles and then we'll pray together of where we need to take this courage. May they see it in us. May we be okay with who God's made us to be as a man and not box in the power and the purposes of God to one expression of manhood. But may we see that God can do anything through any man who surrenders to him. And then may we take this courage that God wants to work in us and may we use it for a kingdom purpose so that other men are in this room next week and the weeks beyond. They're not just going to come because we ran a digital app. They're not going to just come because we have good music and amazing preaching, okay? (laughs) Why are you laughing so hard, okay? We'll do our best in those areas to honor God in that way. I promise you that. But the biggest reason they're going to be here is because they're going to see the courage on your life and your workplace. And they're going to, as the Bible says, see the light you're shining, and they're going to want to glorify your Father in heaven. They're going to see the way you live and realize, he's got something I need. Where did you get that? I know what you're going through, but yet you have a peace and a calm. Tell me about that. Come on to church. I'll show you all about it. As men, we need courage to, number one, stand. We need courage to stand. I'm asking the men of Palm City, if you're new here and you're considering a life of faith, consider it. Look around, watch the men, follow God, and make your decision. But if you are already committed to Christ, I'm asking you to have a new level of courage to stand to where you reject apathy, you reject comfort, you refuse convenience, you get rid of the habitual entangling sin that has just plagued you and maybe even generationally, you stop just building your kingdom and you start building his kingdom. Ephesians 6 says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on God's armor that you may be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. The Bible says, strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. There's a target on a man's back because of what he represents. He represents businesses. He represents a wife and children. He represents things. And the enemy knows if I can get him, it's a a better ROI. So you need to be aware of all the strategies of the devil and put on the armor of God so that you can take your rightful stance in the kingdom and stand firm. But how do we stand? How do we stand with courage? The Bible says they saw the courage of Peter and John, ordinary and unschooled, and they took note that they had been with Jesus. You see, courage is cultivated in Christ. Courage comes from a relationship with God that you commit to cultivating on a daily basis. In order to stand, you have to first kneel. You have to cultivate God's presence when nobody's watching in such a way that you can stand in faith when everybody's watching. Holy Spirit courage comes from Holy Spirit closeness. If you need courage to stand, and you do, my question is, how close to God are you now? My second question is, has there been a time in your life where you've been closer? My third question is, what changed? It's time to have courage to stand. The time is now. You're one prayer, one commitment, one friend away because every Peter needs a John and every John needs a Peter. we're, We're to be in community with each other. You're one prayer, one relationship, one commitment away from your life radically changing. So my encouragement is get in a city group. You can't stand alone for long. You can stand for a season alone, but there's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. 
I need you, you need me. We've got to have each other's back because we need the courage to stand, and we stand by being in biblical community. So get in a city group. I know you're busy. Get in a city group. I can't make them all this summer. Make the ones you can. When you're home, you're here. Get in a city group. Number two, we need the courage to serve. You were made to serve. Like Christ, he came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you feel like you're going backwards, if there's apathy in their life, could it be you're not operating in your Christ-like nature? Where are you serving? Where should I serve? You need to serve your family. You need to serve your church. You need to serve your city. You need to serve your neighbors. You need to serve with your hands, with your mind, with your words, with your resources, with your energy. The kingdom of God is about service, not status. You want to be first? Be last. The greatest among you are the servants. So we need the courage to stand, and we need the courage to serve. So my encouragement to you, see, I'm putting courage in you. That's what encouragement is. I'm trying to put courage in you today by the Spirit of God. Then we need to get on a team. You can be an usher. You can bring order to chaos as people are dropping off them kids and trying to find a seat. Maybe you don't mind a little sweat and a little work. You need to help people find a place for their car so that they can transition into the peace of God after a crazy morning. The kids' ministry shouldn't just be filled with women. There should be some men of God who says, I don't know what I have, but like Peter and John in another chapter, what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, fulfill your destiny. In the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter what family you come from, you are in the family of God and that we speak to these young people in such a way they don't just see women leading them but they see somebody they're going to become leading them on this stage if you play an instrument it shouldn't just be for gigging it should be to bring worship to God and create environments where people can enter into the presence of God if you can sing shout out I'm so jealous But don't stay on the sideline. Have the courage to serve and get in the game. We're going to invest in this next generation. Statistically, they say with Gen Alpha, they are going to be the most non-religious generation ever to live. And I say by faith in Christ, not on my watch. Not on our watch. I can't do it all, but I can do something. And I'm going to have the courage to do something. Get involved with our students. Some come from fatherless homes. I I remember what it's like to kind of feel a call of God, but be real insecure, 13, 14, 15. And for me, I rebelled. But if there was a male presence in their life, what if they stayed? What if their testimony wasn't as big? (laughs) Because they stayed with Jesus. Because somebody responded with courage to be countercultural, to lay aside the pressures that life wants to distract you with, and we stay focused on God's call for our life. And number three, the courage to surrender. The courage to surrender. Solomon in the Bible, maybe you've heard of him, he was the one who built the temple. For God, his dad was David. Uh, King David was amazing in so many ways, but he also was imperfect in so many ways, which shows you that God is notorious for using people who are ordinary like us. But Solomon built the temple, and the Bible says that Solomon was the wisest person ever to live. And I believe a lot of that was because David chose to fight battles so that his son didn't have to. You see, David was a warrior. David had to fight the battle so his son could build the temple. I wonder what battles I need to fight so that my children don't have to fight the same devils I had to. I wonder if I stay on the sideline, 
They're going to have to fight battles and delay God's plan because I was unwilling to have the courage to live a surrendered life and to play my part. You see, David turned a family line, and we can too. But his son Solomon was the wisest man, and he wrote a book of the Bible, a lot of Proverbs, a lot of songs. He, he was just all over the pages of Scripture, imperfect as he was. And if you think you're the wisest person ever to live, you're like, man, I probably got a good handle on life. I want to read a verse that's the next to the last verse out of the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes that he wrote. And I want you to hear this today, man. The Bible says, here is my final conclusion. So he built the temple that they estimate was worth $50 billion in today's it was all gold. I mean, it was immaculate. He had chariots and horses, and he said, here's my final conclusion. After having all the stuff, fear God and obey his commandments, for this is the entire duty of man. Don't be scared. Don't let culture cause you to shrink back from your God-given destiny doesn't mean you have to be scared of God. That's not the word. It means that we would revere God, that we would honor God, that we would honor his house by being here on Sundays when we're home, that we would honor him with the first of our day and the first of our resources, that we would put him first in our words. Before we send emails, we would pray. We would just revere and have a God consciousness in everything we do. And then out of that, we would just live obedient lives. Honestly, that's our that's our job. I, I can't control outcomes, and honestly, it's exhausting to try. But I can obey because my heart's my responsibility. So what's the action step here? Get right with God. Surrender. Stop playing games. Let June 16th of 2024 be a day where you're marked forever. I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm not playing church. I'm not playing with sin, seeing how close to the line I can get. But I am running from it, and I'm running towards Jesus in his name.